So at the end of the day, we have a really strange mixture of biblical theology, the supernatural world, the unseen world, mixed in with all this UFO stuff, sightings, alleged alien contact and abductions. What do we do with all this? How do we process it? I really do think processing is the key. And what I mean by that is we need to be honest. The world is a lot stranger than what we think it is. Human or non-human biologics? Non-human, and that was the assessment of people uh, with direct knowledge on the program I talked to that are currently still on the program. This is a big deal, and it's a big deal for me as a biblical scholar because when you get into this subject matter, it's inherently about questions like, what really is humanity? Who put us here? What about God? Now for me, this takes us right into the unseen world, the realm of angels and demons and gods and God himself, biblical stuff. been so difficult to get here today I've said you know in the Baptist Church we'd say that the devil's in our way and um, the devil has been in our way through this thing you've stated that the government is in possession of potentially non-human spacecraft based on your experience and extensive conversations with experts do you believe our government has made contact with intelligent extraterrestrials it's something I can't discuss in public setting if you believe we have crashed craft, uh, stated earlier, do we have the bodies of the pilots who piloted this craft? As I've stated publicly already in my News Nation interview, uh, biologics came with some of these recoveries. Yeah. Um, were they, I guess, human or non-human biologics? Non-human, and that was the assessment of people uh, with direct knowledge on the program I talked to that are currently still on the program. <laughs> When I look at the mystery or the supernatural in the Bible, and I see these things being described pretty regularly, of like they were they were experiencing something. Like if I'm going to take it as like a UFO report, sure, they were experiencing something supernaturally that 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 uh, defies what they had current capabilities of seeing. Right. Right. Yeah. And when I put that into like effect of you know what people are seeing now, it's it's to say that you know it's it's the, the pilots that Rogan has had on. One of the main things that I remember about this one guy is him talking about how once they developed a certain technology or certain radar, certain... They could see it. They could finally see it. So if you believe in a, a supernatural and you believe in a natural world, you believe in a heaven and an earth, uh, uh, a supernatural space and an uh, earth space, yeah. that they coexist. Sure. You know, that however you want to define that, the Bible uses those words, mm -hmm. right? And when, when you take those two things... Science and technology, and and not just my opinion, a lot of people's opinion, is what's helping drop the veil in between those two spaces. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Sure. So that now that we have all this technology, people are seeing things more readily now that, that than they were before. And and before, some people were seeing something. Yeah. You know what I mean? And and you know, I, my claim is that the scriptures have truth, our truth, and that that the stories that that are are, are contained in there are are ultimate. Um, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? This is this is the source that I'm going to, right? right. This is the, the the place that I believe truth to be. But you take all the other cultures that are around, and they confirm it with with other stories of other other things that are they're going on supernaturally. What I'm trying to be is open-minded, that the way that I happen to have been raised to see the universe and my culture, there is no reason 
why well, should just take for granted that that's the that's what's really going on in the universe you know like what a presumptuous uh-huh. thing to think is that this story seems so odd to us but it's the biblical author's way of describing how um the kingdoms of our world and and for the biblical authors this meant assyria babylon persia greece um they are the product and the result of human and spiritual rebellions that result in catastrophic violence and bloodshed in our world and these are these were ancient empires where where the king and the, and the warriors valor on the battlefield like you know cracking heads and slitting throats this is how you become a man of the name like those nephilim in genesis 6 verse yeah these are the heroes of the ancient world read the read homer's odyssey and it's the whole story yeah. about them <laughs> And so um, what the biblical authors are telling us with this story is that um, when, we, when we look out at a violent government, you know, here in our modern worldview, we just think like, oh, stupid humans, bad policy. And with the biblical authors, what Paul the Apostle wants us to see, um, and this isn't just Paul's idea, uh, this goes all the way back to Genesis 6, is to say, no, nah, man, there's two realms overlapping here. And there are dark powers at work that are trying to destroy God's good world. As knowing what we know about the size and complexity of the cosmos, how do we get our heads wrapped round the claim that, to quote, the creator of the entire universe has chosen to live uniquely on a small ridge called Mount Zion near the eastern edge of the Judean hill country and he may even be quoting from you there, Tom. So um, do, you, do you want to comment uh, on that? That, that, is, that is a quotation. Yes, it's a quotation from one of my books. And I, I, that's something I was struck by enormously when I first lived in Jerusalem, which was back in 1989. And uh, saying the Psalms day by day, I was staying at St. George's Cathedral and taking part in their morning and evening prayer. You realize that the Psalms are saying this kind of thing. Um, I have chosen Zion for myself. This is my habitation forever. And when you say that in England or America or somewhere, it doesn't strike you quite as forcibly as when you're in Jerusalem and you know you're talking about (laughs) that little hill just down the road. So that sums up in a nutshell, the same thing that Solomon says in his prayer in 1 Kings 8, which is, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house that I've built. Nevertheless, you have chosen to put your name here so that when we pray towards this house, then you will hear in heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear, you will forgive. And so it's it's woven into biblical theology that God is vastly greater than anything we can imagine, and yet has chosen to do this very specific thing. And that is part of the mystery of what theologians sometimes call election, that in order to accomplish his purposes, God chooses this people, Abraham's uh, family, and then he chooses Isaac, not Ishmael, and Jacob, not Esau, and and then after the exile, it, it's a remnant, etc. And out of this remnant, there is this one human being called Jesus of Nazareth, and in him, God says, this is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased, and then he does what has to be done to rescue and restore God's world through his death and resurrection. And and that narrowing down of focus tells me something else about the way God the Creator may have worked in vaster areas than we can imagine, that we don't know if there's anything that we could call life on other planets or in other parts of our um, uh, of our, our ever expanding cosmos, as it now seems. So even within our own galaxy, we, we don't know that there's anything else out there that we could call life, but there might be. And then the question is, so what? Um, and again, this is not something I have researched in any detail. It's not something that a biblical theologian is likely to trip over in, in, in one's ordinary reading. But there are people like my friend and former colleague David Wilkinson in Durham who have written extensively about this. David has one or two books where he deals with the question of of supposing there were life elsewhere, what would that do? And I, I don't see it. I don't see it as a problem. I see it as a curiosity. Um, 
that because of what I believe about God as the good creator of all that is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, um, if there are other life forms elsewhere, then just as there are myriad life forms on this planet, we've done our best to exterminate some of them, alas, mm -hmm. but um, that there are many, many life forms. And I believe God the creator cares about all of them. So it's not a big deal for me to suppose that he might have created other quite different life forms in other parts of the world and that he cares about them too. Um, uh, how that relates to the specific events concerning Jesus um, are not totally different from the question of how the specific events concerning Jesus relate to um, the, the frogs in the pond or the birds in the tree or whatever. Um, that there, there may be an interconnectedness. I think contemporary scientific investigation suggests that there is more interconnectedness between different life forms than we have usually imagined, um, and that that might well spill out, if you like, into the vaster extenses mm. of um, of the cosmos. But beyond that, I'm not sure that anyone can go, and certainly I am not qualified <laughs> to comment much more. I hope you guys are enjoying the channel. I want to take a moment and ask for you to subscribe. We're growing rapidly, and I am so grateful for the reach that God's given this channel, but I want it to continue to grow so we can help get this message out about the good news about what God's done for this world and the hope that we have in Jesus. So if you could take just a quick minute, it's only a second to you, but to me it means a lot. Just press the subscribe button for us. Click on that and uh, follow us. You're going to have a lot of great content coming out in the future and a lot of great content to check out in the past. So just wanted to pause and say thank you guys for all that you're doing for this channel and please subscribe. One of the reasons why a lot of Christians are troubled by the idea of whether there could really be aliens or not, either in the past or in the present, is that, well, the Bible doesn't describe them, the Bible doesn't mention them, and so that becomes an argument against the idea, so that if they showed up, ooh, that troubles us, there goes our Bible out the window because the Bible never said anything about that. So they'll take a stand that it can't be true because of absence in the Bible. Well, if you really think about it, that's a pretty poor argument because the Bible doesn't mention a lot of things that we know are real, like cars or microwaves or toilet paper, okay? There are lots of things that aren't in the Bible that we just know are real. Another one is the image of God. If there are really aliens out there, then humanity is no longer unique. Now, when I put things that way, you can already tell that people are sort of predisposed to understanding human uniqueness and the image of God in a very particular way. They'll equate it with intelligence. To make the image of God any particular quality is a mistake because not all human beings at all stages of their development, either pre-birth or in old age, have certain qualities that have historically been identified with the image in their fullness or even equally. We'll notice in Genesis 1.26 that we have the wording there, let us create humankind in our image. Then the very next verse it switches to singular. So God created humankind in his image. Why do we have plurals mixed with singulars? Well, the reason is because God is speaking to people, beings, probably a better word, that are already there, individuals, intelligent beings, they're the sons of God from Job 38 that were there present at the foundation of the world. He announces his intention, let's create humankind. But when he actually does, only God is the creator. You know, all the verbs are singular, all the pronouns are singular. Only God is the creator. So the plural language is important because he's referring to the members of the spiritual world, the heavenly host. He's bringing them into the conversation about imaging. Let us create humankind in or as our image.
Okay, so everything I'm about to say, even to me, sounds crazy. But it is actually what's going on in the biblical author's minds. Okay. Go in here. So Genesis 126, you know, out of the gate, let us. Who's noticed that before? Like most perceptive readers. And of course the question is, who's the us? Right? Who is the us that I'm supposed to know is already on the scene? And that us is actually going to appear multiple times. God addresses in us in chapter 3 when he expels humanity from the garden. And he says humanity has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. When God goes down to inspect Babylon, he says, let us go down and see what trouble the humans are up to. There's multiple of these divine plurals throughout the Hebrew Bible. And if you look wider, again, I'm trying to summarize what we've already talked about. If you look wider in the Hebrew Bible, it's God talking to his staff team. And his staff team is made up of the host of heaven. Yeah? You've heard that phrase, the host of heaven. And the host of heaven, of course, are right here in verse 16. This is where God's making his divine counsel. The big light, the little light, and the stars. So I just looked this up to fact check. Okay. So stars, kochavim, it appears 37 times in the Hebrew Bible. Uh -huh. And every single time, it's referring to a celestial being. Every single time in the Bible. Correct. It's in, not the Hebrew, in, in the Hebrew Bible. In the Hebrew Bible. The it hosts of heaven. The hosts of heaven. And then at the ending, at the conclusion of the skies and the land were completed, all their hosts, the creatures on the land, and creatures in the sky, the host of the skies. Do you see that? The heavens mm -hmm. and their hosts, the land and their hosts. Who are the land and their hosts? Humans and animals. Mm -hmm. Who are the hosts of the heavens? Yeah. Oh, it's the heavenly beings. The, the whole setup is you have the chief Elohim, chief God, mm -hmm. the chief spiritual being, right. who's the creator and ruler of all, who wants to share his world Mm -hmm. and run it and beautify it and make it cultivate through a partnership yeah. with the celestial rulers and the terrestrial rulers. Yeah. Genesis 1 is giving us the two mirrored stories okay. of heaven So what does it mean that the yeah. terrestrial rulers yeah. are made in the image of the celestial rulers? Yeah, what totally. does that mean? Yeah, okay. So here's what I'm pretty certain is what's happening. Okay. The idea is that it's an inversion of your expectations. The lights in the sky, it's clear how they're symbols mm -hmm. of the divine glory. They glow and they're, yeah, and they're, they're way above. They're way above, and, yeah. right? Similar to God's transcendent authority and so on. So you guys, this is exactly, I keep bringing up Psalm 8. This is the, this is the single purpose of Psalm 8. Mm -hmm. It's a reflection on Genesis 1. And how remarkable it is that God, the, the creator's divine majesty and splendor, has been given as a crown to the dirt bags down here. You've crowned the dirt bags with the divine glory and majesty mm -hmm. of the heavens of the heavens. Yeah. Right? That's a plot twist. And so that's what it means when the author says, you made human a little lower than Elohim. And you can see our English translations. This is the New American Standard. New American Standard translates that line as God, God, but then they tell you in the footnote, well, it's the Hebrew word Elohim, mm -hmm. so it could also refer to the other spiritual beings. Yeah. Which right. makes perfect sense. Yeah. Let us make human in our image. So humans are meant to be crowned with the glory and the light, the light mm -hmm. and the glory and the transcendence, even over, even right alongside God and the spiritual beings. Dude, this is so key. So we're just going to race right here. In the book of Genesis, mm -hmm. Joseph, he's the super important culmination of all the themes of the snake crusher, the seed of the woman. Mm -hmm. And he has this dream, makes his brothers angry. And one of his dreams is about the, the list of the celestial rulers in the same order they're given in Genesis 1, bowing down to him. Mm -hmm. He's having a dream about what an exalted human image of God would truly look like. That the celestial beings will actually it bow would, down. It would be a human so unified with the divine that he mirrors God's rule mm -hmm. and even rules over the celestial being. In the so th in the book of Daniel, for example, when you go uh, to Daniel and he describes what the new creation and resurrection people of God are going to be like, Lo and behold, what language does he use? 
right? People will rise to eternal life and they will shine brightly. Oh, like what? <laughs> like the brightness of the expanse and like the stars. And it's not just a metaphor. I always just thought this was all metaphorical language. Okay. And it's symbolic language. What's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, actually, metaphor. We're going to show a video on metaphor. Actually, forget what I just said. <laughs> uh, I used to think that this was just a, a happy figure of speech. Yeah. It's a symbol. But it's getting to something it's very It's getting important. to something. The biblical vision of human existence is that we are made for so much more than we even realize. Yeah. And that our truest identity is to be so unified with God and partnering and ruling this world in the love and power of God that it would be easy to mistake a fully image of God bearing human with the divine glory itself. Hmm. And so, yeah, and you, to, you were telling me about Moses. He comes down from the mountain. Moses. It's Moses. And it's his this. face That's is right. shining. Yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly right. It's, yeah, when Jesus goes up on a mountain or when <laughs> in Jesus Mark goes up chapter 9, yeah. and he starts talking with the two humans other than Enoch in the Bible who didn't die, who were taken up into God's presence and who both went to mountains yeah. and experienced the glory, right? The divine glory. And what does Jesus do? <laughs> right? He starts, he starts glowing. <laughs> he starts glowing like a star. <laughs> what is this, right? Yeah. So this is Mark chapter 9. Yeah, so this is all, this is a really important part of the biblical storyline is humans are dirtbags that God in his grace wants to elevate to share in the divine rule. Mm. Like the, like the heavenly beings who are themselves symbols of God's light and life and glory. Of course, they don't realize that. And then the whole storyline of the Bible is giving you images and pointers forward to the new creation, resurrection, destiny of humans. Someone on uh, YouTube just thought you said Moses didn't die. So you're referring to, you were referring to Enoch. I'm sorry, Enoch and Elijah. And Elijah. Um, sorry, yes, Moses and Elijah, nobody knows where they're buried. Oh, uh, okay. Nobody knows where they're buried. Got it. Enoch and Elijah didn't die. Thank you. But for example, Paul, the apostle, this is in Philippians chapter two. He can just throw this out there and be like, hey, you know who you are as followers of Jesus in the world. You shine like stars. You're like stars shining. And you're like, oh, that's a pretty figure of speech. But no, dude, he really means it. You're stars shining because at the end of chapter three, he's going to be, listen, our citizenship is in the new creation in the heavenly realm. And that's not where we're going to go. It's where the heavenly is going to come to us in the new creation and transform our dirtbag bodies mm -hmm. into the glorious body, mm. the star-like bodies. Some new kind, of, and new kind of body. Yeah, so stars is one of the main images to talk about the glorious nature of the new humanity mm. in the new creation. It's crucially important for the biblical storyline. So this is all going back to let us make human in our image. Yeah. Human or non-human biologics? Non-human, and that was the assessment of people uh, with direct knowledge on the program I talked to that are currently still on the program. It I'm often asked, well, are there UFOs? And when people typically ask that question, what they sort of mean up front is, do you believe that there are extraterrestrials flying craft around the sky? It's a sort of a simplistic way to approach things though. Yes, there are lots and lots of UFO sightings that are legitimate. But what does that mean though? It means somebody's looking up in the sky and they see something that they can't identify. That's all it means. Now, even if they're a trained observer, like a pilot or a military person, someone who's used to seeing, you know, aircraft, even they will see things that they cannot identify. They don't really know what that is. There are thousands of such reports every year in the United States. This is not an isolated sort of thing. So if that's what we're talking about, yeah, there are UFOs. The question is, again, how do we process what we've seen? There are experimental aircraft that very few people even among trained pilots, would know what that thing is. Again, we have a long history of this in the United States. All that said, though, there are some that just defy categorization. There's something about the object, either in terms of the way it changes shape, 
or you have instances where one will explode, for lack of a better term, come apart and then reassemble. Things like this that just don't seem to fit any of the other templates. So there are anomalies. View, and this is the view that I take in the facade, is that Roswell was an Operation Paperclip screw-up. This was a program begun by our government during World War II. We knew we were going to win the war. The question became, what do we do with some of the, the people who are sort of at the forefront of technologies we're interested in, like the V-2 rocket? President Truman at the time did not want anyone from Nazi Germany or Japan who was involved in war crimes brought into our country, even if it was for an ostensibly good purpose. Let's tap their brains and, and, and get their technological knowledge. There were people though who disagreed with him. And so what they did along the chain of vetting people was if they got a really interesting candidate that they knew would be rejected because of a connection to like the death camps or something like that, they would put a paper clip on that person's file. And that was a signal to the next person down the line to pull that file, give that guy a new history, clean up his record, and then pass it on. Now, we got over 700 Nazi scientists into the country working for us in this project. Some of the most famous, Werner von Braun, who became number two at NASA, really responsible for a lot of our rocketry, our, our space program, and he also became Walt Disney's spokesperson for the Disney's World of Tomorrow. I remember seeing von Braun on TV. He was a Nazi. But again, nobody really knew the exact details of his history because they'd been deflected, erased, or, or manipulated. What I think happened is we got a number of these people over, especially the ones who sort of knew about exotic craft, you know, flight you know, modifications, how to build different craft. We know the Nazis were working on wingless aircraft, delta shapes, which if you go back to the early reports of quote-unquote flying saucers, the reports don't actually say that the craft looked like saucers. It says they were triangular delta craft that moved like saucers skipping across you know, water, that, like a stone or a saucer. The flying saucer term actually comes from a case uh, in the Northwest, where I'm at right now. Kenneth Arnold is the big case. He was flying a small plane, and while he was in the air, he saw a number of craft flying in formation. And he said that they moved like plates skipping across a flat surface or water. And he used the term saucer to describe, again, this sort of skipping motion. And out of that came the, the, the whole term flying saucer. But when he was asked to draw what he saw, he drew delta wing craft. He didn't draw a perfect circle in like we typically think of with flying saucers. Now we can look in hindsight and we know, again, some of the things that they were working on. We know the processes that they were using to do this. And these things show up in the Majestic documents. And some also very human technologies. The craft at Roswell, for instance. You'll, you'll read about, again, exotic things. That, oh, we don't know how this works or what it is. And then they'll have things like gears. Okay. You know, why would you need a gear in a, in a craft you know, of, of this nature, if it was truly something that could travel through space. There are incongruities there. You have Roswell. This is the place where we stored our nuclear bombs. This was an important base. What would the public reaction have been in 1947, right after the war, to find out that at this base, we had personnel who had been working on things from Nazi Germany? I mean, that, that would have just caused an uproar even if they weren't located specifically there, 
to learn that we had them in our scientific apparatus, that they had not been prosecuted, that their records had been sanitized, and here they are on our payroll, on the taxpayer payroll, that would have just caused an uproar. It's a very good cover story to take what happened at Roswell and call it extraterrestrial or say it's a mystery because it helps you cover up and misdirect attention from what you're really doing. Let's talk about um, aliens. Yes, yes I, I'm always amused when people use the word aliens because until very recently, and it may still be the case, if you fly to America and if you're British, then when you come to passport control, um, you have a choice between US passports and aliens. And uh, I've often thought, you know, okay, I'm an alien, as, according to this, but I don't have uh, little <laughs> green ears or whatever. Um, so the word aliens covers many things. And of course, it's just a, a, an old Latin word meaning difference, uh, different things, different people. Um, but we've used the word in different senses is what I'm saying. And obviously, here it refers to um, creatures, sentient beings is a way of putting it, what counts as sentient, some people would say that the the trees and the flowers are are sentient beings. Um, and of course, until comparatively recently in the history of the human race, um, until maybe 600 years ago, um, most humans in Europe and Africa were aware of other humans in Europe and Africa and in uh, further out in Asia, but were completely unaware of the whole world that we think of as the Americas. And that when they found America, or when, which is of course a, a, a particular particular odd way of putting it, America was always there <laughs> when they um, stumbled upon it, then they had serious questions. Do the people who live here have souls? Are they real human beings? Do they need saving the same way that we do? So in a sense, what's happening now is we're asking the same questions that people in the not too distant past asked about people that we would now recognize as other human beings, even though they had very different customs, cultures, etc. And of course, Within the planet, as we now see it, there, was all, there were all sorts of interconnections and the prehistory of um, the different uh, ethnic tribal groups, etc., can be now traced by archaeology and so on. Whereas we would find it very difficult, I imagine, to do anything similar, supposing other sentient beings were to be found not just on Venus or Mars, but on um, uh, in places... Uh, far further out in the mm. in the larger um, outer space. Um, so yes, C.S. Lewis does explore this, and Perilandry he has a scene which is really rather like what Genesis three might have looked like if Eve, Eve had eventually said no. Um, and it's a wonderful temptation scene which then goes the other way. Um, but but yeah, Lewis is asking those questions really as a way of addressing some of the what if questions which then bounce back on us. How do we understand our own our own place in the great scheme of things? Uh, I I remember when I was a teenager, there was a song which people, um, uh, which was quite popular um, among a sort of newer Christian music in the 60s and 70s, which was about supposing there were other stars and planets which had other creatures. Will there have to be multiple inc incarnations? Will the Son of God have to die in each one of those in order to redeem them? And I remember at the time being a bit puzzled about that and thinking, actually, if that what the church has always said about Jesus is true, then Jesus is the embodiment not of uh, a local deity who belongs to this planet only, but of the God who made heaven and earth and the whole thing. Mm. And that just as it's very specific and very odd in a way, seen from the perspective of 18th century universal enlightenment philosophy. Very odd to say that God came as a Jewish man in one part of the world at one moment in history. So it would only be the same oddity, magnified a bit, but basically the same, to say that uh, whatever has happened in the entire cosmos, 
this Jesus and his death and resurrection is the very center of everything. Now, people would say, oh, that's so so parochial, so almost selfish to think like that. But it is pretty much what Colossians 1 mm. says. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In him, all things were created in heaven and earth, etc., etc., etc. And then and he is the, the, the start of it all, firstborn from realms of the dead, so that in everything he might be preeminent. You know, if you read Colossians 1, 15 through 20, and, and carefully and prayerfully thinking about these issues, I think you would probably conclude that if there are other sentient beings, then the Jesus that we happen to know by a series of providential accidents, etc., is still the Redeemer for them as well, just as Jesus was the Redeemer for the many races and nations and ethnic groups who Western Europeans knew nothing of in, say, the 13th century. Um, but when they w when they became aware that there were such people, then it became clear mm. that Jesus was the Redeemer for them as well, and that Jesus had had ways of making that known to them in advance of um, colonializing missionaries and so on. That's where the real mystery would come. Um, in what way is the Creator God already in touch with them, as it mm. were? And just as with other species within our world, um, whether the, the, the birds and the animals and the trees and the flowers and so on, do we have to assume that whatever happens to them happens through us? Or do we not assume that they have their own ways of praising God and of being obedient to God, of which we yes. know very little or yes. nothing? So there are, there are all sorts of mysteries there, but we have to be quite yes. careful because it is all speculation. And... Um, uh, we should not let speculation then outrun our caution, mm. and particularly we shouldn't get so fixed on it that we then ignore the things, the tasks which are immediate and close at hand. I think some of it could actually be overtly demonic. In other words, the mechanism that produces this set of memories can be different. I, I personally have a friend, two friends, who uh, focus on abduction research. They've documented over 100 cases where they will either lead someone to Christ or train a person to make it a spiritual confrontation when whatever is happening to them happens and they have been delivered from repeated abduction experiences. In other words, they stop. If that's successful, to me that, that says that there's, an, there's some inherent spiritual element to this particular thing within this big umbrella world we call UFO stuff. But since it's inherently spiritual and it's evil and it's wicked, a lot of UFO researchers are the enemies of the whole subject. They think it's contrived or they think it's abusive. They don't think it has anything to do with aliens at all. I think ultimately, uh, if this is the content of the messaging, it's so directed, again, in anti-Christian or subversion of Christian theology that it's very easy for me to think of it in terms of a deception. Uh, by, again, a, a superior intelligence, but not one that comes from another planet. We're talking about a sinister intelligence from the spiritual world, the kind of unseen realm that the Bible talks about. Now, we would use the word demons, demonic, for that sort of thing. It's actually much wider than that. Again, my specialty is the unseen realm, and that realm is a lot bigger than just angels and demons. But for the sake of talking about the messaging, it's really dark. It's no exaggeration to say that the messaging that people supposedly get from aliens is inherently anti-Christian. And what I mean by that is Jesus is nothing special. He is a human that we selected to communicate to other people, or he's one of us. And it really doesn't do that to other religions.
Well, I, I view this part of ufology as really nothing more than intelligent, demonic beings using old lies and repackaging them for a 20th and 21st century audience. What to a 20th and 21st century person would be godlike? An extraterrestrial. It's very simple. It's, it's an intelligent being that isn't us. It's not part of the animal kingdom. It's so transcendent when compared to us that it becomes a very convenient vehicle. And if you really think about it, alien messaging, U UFO stuff on that level, is really sort of like converting heaven to space. You have heaven without the God of the Bible. You have a transcendent destiny for humanity without any accountability at all. The, the whole question of sin and salvation isn't even on the table, but yet you get to keep all the good parts. Oh, we have this great destiny. Oh, we're gonna become godlike. Oh, the, the deity is interested in us and loves us and has a message for us and picks some of us to convey this message and make us special. You have all of that repackaged in this sort of technological society garb as aliens. This was yeah. their way, it was, a, it was their framework for talking about dark spiritual powers that are behind the, the, the violent empires of our world. Genesis 3.15, when God um, exiles the humans, what he promises is that a seed will come from the woman who will crush the head of the snake. And so what you're looking for is a human who won't give in to the deception of the snake, uh, but rather who will overcome the snake. The whole point is this leading us to Jesus. <laughs> As, yeah. as he is the human in whom divine and human, image of God, image of man, heaven and earth meet together in one person. Um, and so the stories about him being tested in the wilderness is about he is the he is the anti Cain, <laughs> uh, and he's the anti Nephilim, and he defeats uh, um, the the tester in the wilderness, and then he's going to go on to do everything he's going to do, but. The point is that Jesus sees himself stepping into this drama between this, this battle of two realms. And that explains all of his exorcisms and why that was such a big deal to him. But it just strike me as kind of cool, but also weird about Jesus is that, you know, he was so, it, exorcism was such a big deal for him. But if you fit him into this story, with this view of the cosmos from Genesis 1, it makes perfect sense uh, why Jesus mm -hmm. is, is going around doing doing what he's doing, and it makes perfect sense of why the Apostle Paul wants to invite us as followers of Jesus to see that these two realms are very much still My view, in operation. Again, if we, if we take off the table the nuts and bolts kind of discussions about, you know, hey, could there be aliens or not, you know, the academic discourse. If we take that off the table and we talk about the spiritual messaging elements, uh, I think what's going on is we have intelligent beings, intelligent, non-human, divine, spiritual beings, whatever you want to call them, trying to control the language of spirituality. A lot of this sort of messaging and discussion really results in, for many people, and again, I think this is the goal of intelligent evil in this regard, redefining things like God. What does that word even mean? Who are we? What does it mean to be human? How did we get here? Who put us here? And what is our destiny? How do we have, a, do we have a relationship with this God? Have we offended him? Is there such a thing as sin or not? But I think the intelligent evil wants to control and redefine the terminology. They want God redefined as a transcendent extraterrestrial. They want Jesus redefined as a messenger from the transcendent extraterrestrial or an extraterrestrial himself. Uh, they want the need of humanity not equated with sin, a solution for sin, but to evolve to be a transcendent being like they are. Think about it. If you had the same vocabulary that we use in religious discourse, God, Jesus, salvation, 
humanity, destiny, transcendence, glorification, heaven, all these things, but they all had different meanings that attached themselves to this whole extraterrestrial question. Well, guess what? You get to keep your Bible. We don't change any of the words. However, what the words mean is something different. This is something akin to, conceptually at least, when the Nachash, the serpent, walks up to Eve and says, hey, did God really say? So when Mike goes into a, a, a UFO convention, the guy is like a missionary on, on the mission field, all right? And so he is really honestly concerned about the souls of each individual person that he would talk to, okay? Like, I've never heard anybody else who's like, I'm going to go try to minister to, you know, people who really think that what I have to say is 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 crazy because as an academic, as a as a PhD from the top school of original languages in North America, University of Wisconsin Madison, you could live your life being so concerned that whoever you are associated with is going to destroy your academic reputation. Yeah. That you will be seen as as less than in the academic world. Even though Mike had the chops and everybody respected his chops. But, but Mike wasn't concerned about that. Like his ministry was to people who are trying to make sense of those things that don't make sense. And that's where aliens and, and demons comes from. I wouldn't be surprised if when all the, uh, when all the views are counted everywhere, that that ends up being the most watched piece of media that I've ever done. Um, so, and then of course, Mike takes on not just alien encounters and all that stuff, but he takes on um, the ancient aliens and uh, ideology because it's very much that show is very much about spiritual messaging yeah. and uh, it's very much in some ways an attack on scripture yeah and and instead of just brushing it off as silly nonsense and going on with his life mike had the patience to take all of these claims um seriously i don't know if that's the right word but he would take yeah. them at face value yeah. And he would take people who were proponents of them and he would methodically work his way through the legitimacy of their claim and then point someone back to scripture without insulting that person yeah. Respect. For, for buying into that particular viewpoint. Yeah. You know, it, maybe it's a conspiracy, maybe it's this, that, but, but his, his perspective was that he's not just going to take that person and write them off as a kook. And this is somebody who is hungry and they're trying to make sense of their world. I think I can bring the scripture to bear on that and, and minister to that person. Wow, what a beautiful description of that ministry. And, and I guess I could sense it, but I didn't really know it like that. And that is, that's, that's so beautiful because for him to have that as a mission field, not only did he give, uh, as, as a, a respected scholar, did he give uh, credibility to areas that don't normally get any look, but then he took those areas that don't get any look and took the people that are in them, and he was Jesus to them. And that is a beautiful snippet to honor him and his story. but I'm serious about it. I don't like when people are lied to, not just about what's the content of the Bible, 
but I don't like when they're deceived by the content, you know, some narrative that comes from any other ancient text.